Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And uh, I'm Tyson Mudricks. What's up, Jimmy? Oh, Tyson. It's fun. I was just talking to our guest and to you about the fact that we're recording this at the end of the day. So we've got to see if we can bring the same energy and oomph that we do when we record in the morning. Man, no chance is going to happen for me. I'm, I'm actually tired. I've had a long freaking week, but uh, I, I'm still excited to be here, though. I, I'm going to have energy, but not as much energy. Well, that's all right. Sometimes you're a little too hyper anyway. You want to go ahead and introduce our guest? I do. Um, give me a second. Uh, our guest today is Michelle Delino. I actually don't have a bio in front of me like I, I like I normally have, so I can't do a full introduction. But Michelle, thanks for yeah. being on the show. How are you doing? Hey, good, good, good to be here. Yeah, it's um, afternoon here too. It feels like it feels like it's been a long week. I can't believe it's not Friday. How did that happen? <laughs> Michelle is one of our few guild members who lives on the West Coast, so we're happy to record this later in the day. And I was looking over the notes that Becca sent us over about you, and one of the topics that you said you felt comfortable talking about was overcoming adversity and dropping out of high school. I want to hear all about how you go from <laughs> dropping out of high school to sitting in that chair running your own seven-figure firm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting story. I mean, I guess the, the high-level overview of that um, so I've been running the firm here for seven years. Um, before that, I was in private practice, kind of working backwards. Before that, I was clerking. But way before that, um, I dropped out of high school. I had kind of a rough time. Like, you know, I found my initial clients. I was in public defense, and I kind of bonded with them over that, being able to tell them that I dropped out of school like you, so there's no reason you can't turn it around if I did. Um, I dropped out of school. I had some stuff going on when I was a teenager, like a lot of teenagers do. And it took me a while to figure things out. So I then became a manager like people do in Seattle of Starbucks. Um, became a manager of Starbucks. I did that for a while. I learned all the important life lessons and management lessons. And I credit a lot of running my business well to uh, learning how to run a Starbucks. So I did that before I ever went to college. And then figured out, I kind of tapped out there and I needed to get it together. And then I passed a high school equivalency exam, got myself into college, got myself to a four-year college, and then on we go from there to law school. So really anything can happen, you know? And along the way, um, I've overcome cancer a few times, had to deal with that while I was in college. Once I finally got on my feet, had to find out um, you know, in my 20s, I was dealing with that. So really nothing that comes up now seems like that big a deal. Best I guess I got to start with saying, holy shit. Um, <laughs> and like, I, I, I've got so many like places I want to go with this. Um, I originally wanted to ask you about, you know, Starbucks and running the business and how that helped you. But I, I, I want to go back, actually. <laughs> um, I guess, why'd you drop out of high school? Like what, what, yeah. What, you know, did, why, and then what, I guess, what lessons did you learn from that? Um, I guess the why was just, I wasn't, it's crazy because I wasn't getting along with my parents and I felt like I knew everything better than them. And I didn't really mean to drop out. I just kind of felt like my initial thought was I'm going to go to a community college and I'm going to finish there. And then I ended up not doing that. And, um, ended up just working and then didn't want to go back because I was embarrassed and I actually moved out of my parents house and my parents were both educators my mom's a well they're, she's not anymore she's retired but she was a school principal and my dad's a school guidance counselor so kind of not doing school the traditional way was kind of the biggest um you know in your face to them at the time so um and I'd been a really good student before that so it wasn't the way I planned it um but that's what happened and I think the biggest thing I learned, I'm actually glad though, I, I think because in the beginning I felt a lot of insecurity about not taking the traditional path and I wouldn't really trade it for anything now because I learned so many more things, um, having different jobs, dealing with different kinds of people, sort of being forced into the working world earlier, I think, than you know, your average went straight through high school to college person. I mean, I never lived in a dorm or did any of that. Um, and I, you know, learned how to get an apartment and pay bills and do stuff a lot earlier. So I think from the very beginning, it kind of shaped who I am and how I deal with things. So this is so great for me to hear right now because my eldest son is 18. He thinks he knows everything. Mm. He's, he's looking for all those FU moments he can mm -hmm. before he leaves for college. 
Yeah, he'll be fine though. Like even if he gives you a big F you moment, like I had talked to my parents for almost a year and now I talk to them like every day. So, I mean, <laughs> it'll be fine. <laughs> so tell us about you're ending college and thinking about law school. What is that? I mean, that that's a huge shift from- You know, it was never actually a question when I, um, when I, the, the way I kind of do things is I always have a plan that I'm working on. And when I went to college, it was to go to law school. It people, a lot of people um, today, like probably couldn't relate to this, but I don't know if you guys remember, Jim, you might remember, cause you're older. Remember like Franklin planners where you would write everything down? Remember that yeah. shit? Like, okay. so I would write down in my Franklin planner, like what's gonna happen here. And so I wrote out when I went to, um, I moved to New York to go to back, when I went back to school, I was like, I'm gonna do this big. So I really wanted to move to New York. So I went to NYU and I wrote out like what was gonna happen every semester and when I was gonna go to law school and when I was gonna graduate. So I mapped out like the next, uh, seven years of my life when I went to college. And I was really determined not to let anything derail that. That was my plan the whole time. And the reason why, this is so misguided now, but when I worked at Starbucks, I worked in this building downtown that had a office tower above it. And everybody that worked in there was a lawyer. And I was like, oh, if these people don't seem that smart and they're making all this money, and if they can do this, I like the idea of it. I thought I could do it. I was like, I can do this. I'm just gonna go to law school. That's what I'm gonna do. And they were always like, oh, come work for us and leave Starbucks and be an admin assistant. And I was like, no, I'm gonna come back and be a lawyer. So that was kind of my, my plan from the beginning. Good for you. Yeah. That is so awesome. My, my favorite part about what you just said, one of my favorite parts was that Jim's older. So that was, that was <laughs> uh, but Man, this is so great. So, I mean, would, is it fair to say, like, you have a pretty good idea of your vision? Like, you knew exactly, like, what you wanted yeah. to do, and then you ex executed upon it. Like, yeah. so, like, you have the same idea for, like, whenever you're, like, 65? No, um, not anymore. My vision's changed. I mean, you know, when I went to law school, I had no idea what I wanted to do after that. So, then I just thought I wanted to work for somebody else, and, you know, I didn't really even think about starting my own firm. So, I went and I worked for a court at first because I had no idea how to get experience. And I think I was always trying to get like legitimacy. And I think that kind of comes from dropping out of high school. And I thought, okay, I'll go to work for a court. That'll give me like some street cred and I'll learn stuff. And then I went and worked for a firm. And I thought, I kind of thought I would just stay there for a long time. That's what I saw as my vision was being like the best associate in a criminal defense firm I could be. And then I realized that that vision sort of wasn't really a vision and got derailed when they weren't offering me enough money. And that was the best thing they ever could have done because I realized, why am I doing this for them? I could do this my way. And I left there voluntarily to start my own thing. So now that I've started my own thing, it's been a while, it's been seven years now, which is crazy. Um, I kind of have a, I do have a vision now, um, probably not till I'm 65, because I'm definitely not gonna work that long. But, um, you know, I have, now I have my whole vision shifted. So the vision I thought I was going to have coming out of law school ended up really not being what it was. And at this point, I, mean, I would never work for anyone else. Just like probably a lot of people watching this podcast can, under, can relate to, um, you know, or listening in can relate to. I would never work for anyone else. Um, but, you know, visions can shift and change. And I'm a, I like to plan, but I also like to adapt. So I'm always kind of looking for the next thing to be working on. And if I don't have that thing that I'm working on, I'm going to find it. Um, probably like a lot of other people. Talk to us about the day before you announced that you were going to open your firm and then the day you had your first day at your firm. Yeah, that's funny. When the day before I told people I was going to open my firm, I think people thought that maybe I was just having some kind of breakdown or something because I quit this job and they didn't, nobody really knew what I was doing. They were like, what are you doing? And so I had taken a vacation to um, Hawaii and I think people thought that was sort of crazy because I quit my job. Um, and some people thought maybe I was going to go back to my job. And a lot of my friends and family, you know, I kind of told my family what I was going to do, but no one was really sure. Um, but I was sure. So um, the day before, I just was kind of getting ready. And then the day that I told everybody I was starting, um, the best advice I got was tell everyone. Like, tell everyone. And I wanted to kind of have a uniform. You know, I did a lot of planning. So I was like, okay. I wish I'd, I'd done more because I didn't even know about 
you know, all these different things I found out about later for law firm owners. I didn't even know what I was doing. I just kind of figured it out on my own. But, you know, I was like, I got to have my website. I've got to have a logo. I wanted to like present like I was legitimate because that's kind of a theme for me. Um, so I got everything together and I started telling everybody I could, this is what I'm doing, you know? And I thought it was just going to be me hanging out like in this rented space that I'd gotten, this like 600 square foot rented space, waiting for people to like message me or something. I don't know what I thought was going to happen, but that's not what happened. So yeah. <laughs> so now I want to get back to this Starbucks thing. Um, <laughs> how did, cause I, I've always thought that like working at a place like Starbucks would really help you run a business. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're so great. I mean, at least the Starbucks I go to, they're always usually pretty good and like, like just yeah. really helpful and really nice. Like, so how did that help you run your firm? It helped me a lot. I'll tell you the, the, Three biggest takeaways. Well, so when I started there, I just started there as a making coffee as a regular barista. And then I got really bored and I was kind of always hanging around. And so they said, hey, why don't you join our retail management training program? So I did that. Um, and I learned a ton of valuable things, just basics that I think a lot of people don't know about reading a profit and loss statement, about, you know, maximizing efficiency in the store, about, you know, ordering. I learned a lot of stuff like that. Um, and then I became a store manager when I was 20. But the three biggest takeaways that I think Starbucks still left me with in how to manage my firm were management. Number one was management style. I learned really quickly that you can't manage people the same way like some they had a whole class on this in the very beginning that was kind of the first time i'd ever learned anything like this and they were like okay you can't have every employee doesn't need you know high support and high direction uh, some employees need low support low direction some employees need they kind of drew this um diagram that they walked us through and it really resonated with me and so now even today when i have you know associates or support staff or whoever I always think, what kind of a management style does this person really need? Because I want to help them succeed and I want to bring out the best in them. And I can't be the same, you know, boss to everyone. If I treat everybody with the same, um, you know, level of support, not everybody needs that. Some people need more, some people need less. So Starbucks really taught me that at an early, early age. Um, Starbucks also taught me the importance of connecting with people, which I think I've kind of built my business on. I still see people in that building where I used to make coffee over 20 years ago. And I remember their names. I remember what they used to drink. So now, which I don't know how that happened, but I learned that there. And so now when I meet clients, I might talk to somebody and, you know, get to know something about them and maybe they hire us or maybe they don't. Um, but I'll remember things about them and it, it matters to them. So I connect with people. And I also learned, um, you know, as part of that to listen more and talk less, um, and listening to people, I think working at Starbucks and hearing about their stories, whether it was other staff or the customers that would come in, that's how you build rapport with people. So that um, totally helped in my business. And then the third thing was really just what I mentioned earlier, how to manage a budget. I never would have learned that. I never would have had a clue if I hadn't worked there. So, yeah. This is great. I'm always telling Becca that Tyson needs a lot of support and a lot of direction. <laughs> He doesn't seem to listen, but I'm glad that. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, the one. Yeah, into that model, right? Like, <laughs> let's go ahead and let's go ahead and bring Becca on and let let her uh, talk about. That. See, it hit a raw nerve there, Michelle. Um, so, uh, talk to us about your firm. What do you? Yeah. Do? Um, what, what's, what's your favorite part of running it? What's your least favorite part of running it? Favorite part of running it, it it is it, it's kind of the same. I mean, favorite part of running it, okay. No, maybe not. I was going to say my favorite part of running it is the clients and my least favorite parts of the clients, but I don't really mean that. Um, I'd say my favorite part of running it is um, that it's what I love doing the most. I love the business aspect of the firm. I love um, having the vision and actually seeing it be able to be carried out by different people in the firm. I realized really early on, like I hired an associate right away when I started my practice within like two months, because I realized otherwise it would just be me and I'd be one to one doing what I wanted to do, but I could be one, one attorney to one client, you know, and that's it. Having a staff and having a team, I can be one to many. And I love like kind of seeing, okay, we're going to do this this way and seeing it happen and seeing it work. So I like the execution part of it. And, um, you know, just the implementation of the vision is probably my favorite part. Um, I like the clients too. The least favorite part is probably um, dealing with 
the negativity of family law, which can be really difficult. I think every practice area has its own things. Um, family law has a lot of rewards. You can help a lot of people, but it also, you know, there's a lot of sadness and there's a lot of drama and a lot of stress that can come in. And sometimes you don't have control over that. So, you know, that's, it's, it's not always the happiest. We don't always do the happy kind of family law here. We do a lot of high conflict work and we do a lot of, you know, we litigate and we do a lot of stuff like that. So it's not always happy. So Michelle, you've been through quite a bit, um, clearly. <laughs> you've dropped out of high school, you've gone through cancer, um, and you, you've got this great just energy and you're very positive. I mean, like, what is it that you struggle with in life in general? Not enough hours in the day. Um, time, I would say um, I struggle when I don't have that next thing to be working on. Um, you know, it was kind of like, at first for me, okay, I had my plan, I was going to work this plan. And then I, that's what I like about the firm. I've always got something to be working on, you know, but I struggle when things um, maybe don't go exactly how I want them to go, or maybe something's not working out. You know, I had a plan for we we're going to implement something and it didn't work um, the way I wanted it to, or, um, you know, just, I struggle when things don't go according to plan, necessarily, um, you know, or not... It sounds maybe like a, I don't know, maybe it's something other people who run firms or manage people would say, but I struggle when people don't meet my expectations and when I don't meet my expectations for myself. So I'm like, hey, if other people aren't getting the job done, that's frustrating, but it's also probably because did I not set them up for success? Is there something I could have done differently? So a lot of the time, um, I feel like if I put something together, I can do anything. So if something doesn't happen right the first time, I have to go, okay, got to troubleshoot. And that's not always the easiest thing for me. So then I try to think, who could do this better than me and find someone or hire someone to do it for me? <laughs> yeah. All right. So in, in talking about your firm and signing people up, I noticed in your um, notes to Becca that you have a like an 80% conversion rate on closing. Yeah people that come yeah. to see you and as someone who's going through that a revamping of how we do that here I'd love to hear uh, why you think that is and how it works yeah that's a great question um that's one of the things that's worked really well um for me and I think for the firm it from the beginning and again it just comes to I, I don't know I think everybody does consults differently and I know it's been interesting um especially in the whole COVID era before that, I never wanted to do consults via Zoom or via the phone because I felt like I couldn't connect with people as well or it wasn't going to be as effective. I realized really quickly that wasn't the case. Um, so we do them that way too now. And it really hasn't hurt our conversion rate at all. Um, but I think my conversion rate is high because, again, I do something that a lot of people don't do and I listen. Um, and, you know, I, I believe that in a consultation, you should be doing about less than one third of the talking and the client should be doing the majority of it. Um, and so I think when you have somebody, you know, of course you kind of have to read that, but I think for me, I, I try to work with some of the associates on it who don't have as high of closing rates, but for me, it's really comes down to listening and determining what does this person want? And then at the end, it's really my opportunity to go over what roadmap, road, what roadmaps exist for them and what options that they have, as opposed to trying to talk the whole time and sound, you know, like I know so much to try to sell them on myself. Um, I don't look at a consultation as, you know, I'm not here to just like sell you a car or sell you a pizza or something. I'm here to listen to you and then tell you, even if it's what you don't want to hear. And I find that people really value that. People value getting, um, honest feedback and really feeling like you heard them like you didn't talk over them like you're able to pull from what they said and use their examples um in giving them a roadmap at the end and it kind of makes them want to come along with you you know at the end because you feel like you've heard them now they're hearing you um and i have my three big things that i tell every client and i try to this really matter this is kind of like a life thing and then i'll stop talking but it's three things <laughs> one i tell every client that we have to have trust. Like you have to trust that I know what I'm doing and that I know what I'm talking about, right? And you have to trust that the firm is gonna help 
you. And I have to trust you. I have to trust you that you're going to be honest with me enough that um, we're going to have a good relationship. The second thing is you have to have good communication because attorney client relationships fail because of communication all the time. Everybody knows that. So you have to make sure that we're going to communicate with you the way you want. Do you want a text? Do you want an email? Do you want a phone call? And vice versa. You have to be able, willing to pick up the phone and talk to me. You don't have to want to have a beer with me, but you have to like me enough to communicate with me and not be one of those clients that just goes dark. And then the third thing is, they have to be able to afford it. I don't ever want to put a client in a situation that they can't afford because then that's going to become the focus of the relationship. So I tell the clients, if you have those three things, if you have trust, communication, and you can afford the representation, you're going to have a good relationship, whether it's us or somebody down the street. So make sure you have those three things and you're not going to go wrong. And I think if we match up with them, um, you know, then it works out and that happens more often than not. So Michelle, I mean, a lot of what you're talking about, I mean, it's so true and like listening to clients and everything, but being able to relate to them has a lot to do with your background. I mean, like that, that's a really big part of it. And how do you, whenever you're dealing with your team, like how do you sort of convey that to them and teach them how to relate to clients in the same way? Um, I have, you know, I was talking to an associate about that the other day. Um, I think a lot of the time people get, stuck in not either being able to relate or not agreeing with the client. And one of the things I was explaining the other day, I think a very important skill that everybody needs to learn, whether it's in, uh, you know, closing a client in a consultation or in the representation is that you can validate somebody without agreeing with them. And I can listen to somebody and I do it all the time. I might not agree with 90% of what you just said, you know, if you're sitting here telling me what's going on with you or what you've been doing or what your family law situation is. You might have, you might be in contempt and done a whole ton of stuff, but I can validate why you did those things and your feelings and listen to you and make you feel heard and get on the same page with you. But then I can tell you why it was wrong. And you're going to take that a lot better from me because I just validated how you felt and I related to you. So I try to tell um, my team, you have to separate your desire to maybe say, no, I'm the attorney and I know everything and here's why you're wrong, to treating them like a person. And anybody can do that. It doesn't matter what your background is. Just talk to them like a person and forget, you know, what degrees are on your wall or what you're, you know, tr forget trying to sell yourself. Really just look at you connecting with them and validate them. And you don't have to agree. And then you can tell them, you know, what, what they need to do. So I think that's something that a lot of people just don't get. I am like Tyson before, where I don't know which direction I want to go because there's still a lot of things I want to talk to you about. Um, talk to me about being a female law firm owner. Is there anything special that stands out to you or you think that, I think female women lawyers really are held to a higher standard. I don't think a lot of it's fair. I'm just wondering yeah. what you think. Um, from that's a good question. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know if being a law firm owner necessarily, I think just being a female lawyer, I tried a case, I always think about, I tried a case, it was a few years ago now, maybe it was four or five years ago, and it was with my associate, because it was a huge, there was a ton of experts and witnesses, and so we tried this case together, and um, I had, I, I was responsible for the opposing party, and so, you know, I crossed him, and I did all this stuff, and I think I'm a pretty decent trial lawyer. I thought I did a good job. And then, you know, we got the opinion later and basically this is the only time this has ever happened, but it really sticks with me, obviously, because I'm talking about it. And the judge said basically that I was a bitch and I um, was too aggressive with the other party. I, I mean, I, I did my job. I, 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 you know, meanwhile, the other associate, Mr. So-and-so was, you know, great. But I felt like because I was a woman, it was, oh, I should, I should have known my place. And it was one of the things where I thought, wow, this is what people are talking about. Because before that, I was kind of like, oh, that's not an issue anymore. I mean, I'm in, I live in Seattle. Things are super progressive here. There's a lot of women lawyers, um, you know, whatever. Um, and it didn't really phase me. But when that happened, I kind of thought, wow, this is what people have gone through in much worse um, iterations than me previously. You know, I just feel lucky that it's, two, it's, you know, 2020, and 
I feel lucky to be practicing when I am and not 20 or 30 years ago, which I think would have been much harder. So I kind of don't feel like I have a lot to complain about because that was an isolated incident, right? What if that was every time? I can't imagine it, you know? So I think it's harder for women, but I also think I have the benefit of being somewhere that's really progressive. And um, I think there's a lot of women that paved the way for us that took the brunt of it. So that's kind of how I look at it. I'm just grateful to them. I think you're so kick-ass. You're awesome. Um, so what is your advice? There's a lot of people struggling um, right now. And Jim and I have had a lot of conversations about this. And we've talked to other lawyers. But you've gone through a ton, right? A lot of stuff, right? You've got through a lot of adversity. What are your, what's your advice to people right now that are struggling? Um, things will get better. You know, I know that sounds so cliche. But I think if you let kind of be where you are, but realize things will get better. And what I mean by that is it's okay to say, whether it's in your life, like you're, you know, I mean, I've been divorced, I'm divorced and remarried and I was in a really bad place at one point. It was actually when I started my firm when I was like, wow, this marriage failed. Um, I just quit my job. Why did I do that? Like what, what's going on? Am I going to have any money? I don't really know what's going on. And I kind of let myself be there. And I said, Hey, this is a rough time, but I've got a plan and things are going to get better. And so right now I think with everything that's going on in our world, whether, you know, it's in your personal life or your business life, and there's so many unknowns, let yourself say, Hey, this is a scary time. And again, validate yourself and let yourself be there and accept those things. Don't, don't deny it or don't beat yourself up about it. Accept it, but then look at the next thing you're gonna do. My advice is always to say, okay, what's next? And if you have a trouble finding what's next, get help. I can't tell you how many other lawyers, I think this is something people don't talk about a lot. Um, there's a high risk of substance abuse with lawyers. There's a high um, depression rate. And whether it's you know just people in general or lawyers, if you can't look to what's next and you're really stuck in the now and it's not just a situational for you, get help, whether it's friends, family, therapy, whatever it needs to be, talk to somebody about it and you'll find a way to work through it. So be where you are and look forward. Yeah, you're absolutely right about the depression and suicide and all that stuff yeah. with, with lawyers. Um, yeah. I, had, I lost my train of thought, what I was going to ask you. Um, oh, yeah. Let's say that there was a, a new family law attorney wanting to hang their shingle in Minneapolis, Minnesota, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. What advice would you have them as far as getting new cases? Oh, it, the best cases are going to come not from, don't do, don't like, don't build your business on Google ads. Don't, don't build your business on Google ads or Facebook ads. Um, if you're a new lawyer like, and you wanna start a family law practice, get to know uh, financial advisors, get to know therapists, get to know other attorneys in other practice areas that are gonna refer you cases, bankruptcy lawyers, criminal defense attorneys, get to know people that are gonna refer you cases that are other professionals that are gonna like you and trust you. Those are way better cases than um, you know, Google bringing you people. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, you know, paid ads, but build your business on relationships and it will never stop. If you have 20 people that refer you, you know, to you a one case every other month, you can build a million dollar business on that alone with no advertising. Do that and then add advertising later, you know, focus on the relationships first. And if you do that and you start building up those referral relationships, it's going to pay off for you and you're going to, you're going to be fine. That's really great advice. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to wrap things up because I've got to go and get my vehicle before the end of the day. Um, before I do, I do want to mention Ryan McKean says he loves you, but that, yeah. uh, even though you're a Yankees fan. Oh, I was going to so. say, I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know. We disagree about, 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 uh, about the Yankees and Red Sox. But Ryan, I, I will say one thing about Ryan really quick. I've learned a lot just from looking at Ryan's stuff online um, and, and chatting with him a bit. Ryan is awesome. He is a wealth of knowledge. And one thing I love about Ryan is he's willing to share it. A lot like you guys. So love your yeah, program. Ryan. Yeah, Ryan's great. And he's, you're right. He's, he's so willing to share. And, yeah, which you know, is so great. And then Jay Ruane and Seth Price and all that. They're, they're just great. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm going to let you have one last word on this. What are your thoughts on the baseball season? Oh, 
I'm, well, I mean, I, I guess I feel like the Yankees are going to, Yankees are my team and it's a shortened season. So Yankees are going to, I mean, they're going to take it, but it, it has an asterisk next to it. It just does. I can't help it. I'm glad I've been missing baseball. It's been, talk about depression. I mean, it's been, I kind of get to that point where I really need baseball. I have a home in Arizona that I go to, um, and I really missed out on not having spring training happening this year. I look forward to that every year. I love baseball. It's a big deal for me. Um, so I'm really glad baseball is happening, but I think it's going to be weird. Um, I guess I'm selfishly glad because I can watch it from home, um, and the Yankees are going to take it, and the Mariners are terrible. So if anyone tells you otherwise, um, it's, a mo it's the most pathetic franchise in sports, and I'm from Seattle, and I'm telling you that. But I don't like mediocrity, so that's why I don't like the Mariners. There you go. Don't, hey, don't forget about the birds and the bat, okay? Okay. Cardinals, <laughs> no, I don't. Cardinals. I know. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> that, I've been waiting for a Yankees Cardinals World Series for a while now. That yeah, be that would be that would be a fun one to watch. That would actually be probably a ton of people would watch that too. I think. Oh my gosh, I yeah. agree. It'd be, yeah. be great. All right, I really do have to wrap things up. All right, thanks, Pardon. guys. Thank you. I want to remind everyone, go to the Facebook group, get involved there. We've got a lot of great people. Um, also want to remind everyone, it's really interesting to me, Jim, that a lot of people don't know about the Guild. So you and I are terrible, apparently, about promoting the Guild. But uh, we have a lot of great people, like Michelle, in the Guild. And it's, a, it's a, just a great group of people. So if you're interested about that, reach out to us. Go to MaximumLawyer.com. And while you're finishing the rest of this episode, maybe you know switch over your phone to... The, the review section and the podcast app and just give us a five-star review. We would really, really appreciate it. Jimmy, what is your hack of the week? Well, this is a great call. Um, Michelle Tyson's right. You are awesome. I'm, I'm glad that you came on the show. That was great. Um, my uh, hack of the week is a, a phone app. It's called Just Call and it's on top of Twilio. It's, hmm. out, of, it's out of India. We're using it for our phones, for our, all of our leads. Um, so just the leads team is using it, but it's great. You can transfer the call to the attorney. You can send a message. You can record it if you want. You can listen in on a call with your sales team if you want. So with, with us out giving so much more responsibility to our leads team, it's, it's really great. And it's, it's, it's the cheapest Twilio overlay out there. So we're real happy with it so far. Cool. Very, very cool. All right, Michelle, what is your tip or hack of the week? Uh, hack of the week for me would be, um, well, you know, I was going to give a plug to dial pad. So Jim kind of stole um, what I was going to, what I was going to do. So that's a Wait bummer. Uh, to yeah, it up. <laughs> Use voice over IP. That's my, that's my hack of the week. Get, unchain yourself from the desk phone. Um, we use it. We love it. Um, you know, also too, just get out there. Don't, don't um, lock yourself in your office. I'm in my office today, but there's no reason to be. You, you take your phone number and go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. And so I, I'm not going to call him out. Um, he'll probably give me crap if I do. I, I was talking to an attorney the other day and he's like, well, how do you have, like, how do you all talk to each other? Like, what if your internet goes down? Because like, we were talking about a lot of different things, but like how like we use Filevine, like what, well, what if your internet goes down? I was like, well, the great thing, or or if like, because I was talking about VoIP and our phones are through the internet. I was like, what if your internet goes down? I was like, we're in multiple locations. Like, so like you can like, it doesn't matter if your phones go down in one location. Like, as long as someone is in a location that has the internet, you're good. And it with VoIP. So I, I know people like John Fisher. They talk about having a landline. I just, I don't understand it. No. VoIP is the way to go. I, I, I guess if you have like exclusively one location, maybe, but. I don't know. With these days, you're all over the place. But anyways, so my tip of the week, I thought I'd maybe given this tip, but I guess I didn't. Um, uh, so, so those of you that don't know, I've hired someone like Jim to handle my email. And it is so freaking amazing. It is awesome. Um, I am not quite to inbox zero. We are very, very close. Um, I, again, I'm not going to talk about how, how many emails I had in there because it's embarrassing. But it was it was in, it was over 10,000 is what I'll say. It was a lot. It was ridiculous. And um, she's getting all those archi archived and, and in the right places. It's fantastic. But something that's really cool for me to watch is I've got something, I, I have the free version of email meter. So email meter, M-E-T-E-R. So email meter.com. And it gives you all these awesome stats, like your average response time, 
the messages you, you've received, the, the number of senders, the recipients, all this free data, it analyzes your inbox and you can, you can upgrade for, it's fairly cheap, I think, for a monthly plan to get more information, but it's enough for me. So emailmeter.com, it's pretty awesome. It's free, go check it out. So Michelle, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. I've, I've really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to talk to you guys. Have a great day. Take care. You too. Thanks, Michelle. Bye. Bye. Bye.